You know, today's message is going to be uh, the great thing about preaching expositorily, and that when you take a book of the Bible or a chapter of the Bible and you go word by word, verse by verse, you guys know I don't get to choose the topic. It's the Holy Spirit that chooses the topic, and it's the next verse. So like next week, it's going to be, I already know what the topic is because I'm going to be preaching in the next passages of verses. And that's what happens when you preach expositorily. Uh, you, get to, you don't get, get, get to choose what you preach. And I think Jesus, uh, obviously the Holy Spirit does that deliberately. I want to talk to you today that's going to be, it's going to be, the words are going to come right from Jesus, but I'm going to tell you guys, they're hard-hitting. They're hard-hitting. And it's something that is two passages. We're only going to be in two verses today in Matthew uh, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. But Jesus is going to talk about widening the widening gate. Because I'm going to ask you guys a very direct, pointed question right now. Would you have believed me in the year 2000? Would, you, would Anybody would have believed me if I was stood up here in this pulpit and told you that in 23 short years that some states in America you would be charged with a hate crime in some states in America and jailed for not agreeing to let your seven-year-old change your sex with genital mutilation or castration. Would you believe me? Would you believe me that in some states that you could legally abort a child up to the second day that they are born? Would you believe me? 23 years ago. Would you believe me that a major retail company in the United States, a.k.a. Target, would hire a devout Satanist and pedophile <laughs> to design their gender-fluid clothing line for toddlers and children. Would you believe me? Would you believe me? A major league baseball team would host and promote and reward a satanic, anti-Christian hate group that does mock sexual scenes of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ where they climb up the cross like they do a stripper's pole in a strip club. Would you believe me that a baseball team would reward that group for community service? Would you believe me if I told you the President of the United States would pose with a transvestite on the White House lawn who would then pose topless in front of little children on the White House lawn? Would you believe me? Would you believe me if Army chaplains would get fired for teaching biblical morality. Just, just as plain as out of Genesis 3, just saying that there's only two genders between a man and a woman, and marriage between a man and a woman. Would you believe me that if I told you a gay-affirming leftist political lawyer from the New York Times named David French would teach a gospel series to future pastors at Southeastern Baptist Seminary. Would you believe me? That happened 14 months ago. Would you believe me? In our own denomination, we would have 2,000 churches that we didn't know this until about a month ago that have ordained female and female pastors and deacons. Would you believe me that some of those churches have ordained gay and lesbian deacons and pastors? Would you believe me? Now, we took measures. Our, I was really proud of our convention last month. They took measures to rectify some of that. But I want you to ask you this. Would you believe me? Would you believe me that we would have a pastor in the United States of America that would show up to an LGBTQ pride rally and read Romans 1, 26 and 27 and get arrested for disturbing the peace? When somebody has the audacity to preach and call out this behavior, you're labeled as a bigot, you're labeled as a racist, you're labeled as a misogynist, and look what's happening to our children. You're labeled a fundamentalist, because you're, then you're going to get lectured because, because, oh, well, Jesus preached love and kindness and compassion, and you need to tone it down, Pastor. I'm not going to tone it down, because I'm going to tell you something, guys. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will pull you to preach something that's not comfortable. Satan through society has a way of widening this gate. 
And there's a reason all these things that I'm telling you is happening right now. Because Satan has made the highway to hell. He's made it flat. He's made it with fleshly temptations. He's made it with worldly distractions. He's made it with moral compromises. And what we're seeing today, right now, we're seeing Satan's daily influence. And he has cunningly convinced so many people that repentance doesn't matter, that sin doesn't matter. We need to cherish and live by God's word doesn't matter. Politicians use this thing called the Overton window before they will, they will take a stand on the issue. And the Overton window is a, a, a political window, okay? And if a politician can step inside the Overton window, they think they're okay with their constituents. Because if they move to the right of that Overton window, they probably think that's radical. If they move too far left of the Overton window, they think that's too far radical. But here's what's happened in the United States. The Overton window that used to be here, what's normal, is now way over here. You, you follow me? But that's for politicians. But Jesus doesn't use the Overton window. Jesus is talking, okay, today about a gate. Because everyone's always asking, well, what did Jesus say? Well, I'm going to tell you what he said. There's a good reason that Jesus devoted a lot of this message on the Sermon on the Mount to this very thing. And I'm going to tell you guys, this text today is only two verses, but it's beautiful, it's truthful, and it's hard-hitting. And it's not by Scott, it's by Jesus. Can I get an amen? Jesus is going to tell us a vital, vital truth about the gospel. And that is, in two short passages, in five words, enter by the narrow gate. And it's something that we all must heed. And the title of our sermon today is The Narrow Gate. I'm going to preach expositorily two verses, Matthew 13, uh, ch uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. As I read God's word, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we love you. And I know that you planned this message long before I was even born or thought of. And I know that you preached these words over 2,000 years ago on that great mountain. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this text. I thank you for this word. I thank you that you, you put it on my heart to preach this today with passion. And I, I just pray, Lord, that I get the text right I pray, Lord, that I know that you're in your midst right now and the Holy Spirit of God is here. And I pray, Lord, right now, I pray, Lord, right now that somebody is changed by this. I pray that we know that this life, the narrow is the road. And I know that if it wasn't, you wouldn't tell us. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, okay, so let's go right to the first verse here. In verse 13, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, that's where we'll start. Enter by the narrow gate. Everybody say narrow with me. Narrow. narrow. Okay. So I want you to keep this in mind. I'm going to have you say something else here in a second. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to, everybody say it with me, destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Now here's what I want you to understand. Jesus is not saying this is an option. He's not saying, well, I, I, th this is what I'm recommending to you guys. I just recommend this to you guys. You, you know, you probably should go over here. No, he's, he, he's giving us a command. You're going to enter by the narrow gate because the other gate, it depends on translation that you're in, destruction is death. Destruction is it's going to lead you to hell. Because here's what's going to happen here. Jesus is going to illustrate in the Sermon on the Mount, two gates. And it's this simple. And it's so profound. One is wide. And one is narrow. And why is it profound? Because I'll tell you guys, it goes against every narrative of the world today. Every one of them. It's one of those passages that I wish everybody knew. 
I wish everybody knew this passage because it's so true. And it's, so, it, it, it's, it's life or death. Two gates, one wide, one leads to destruction, one which leads to hell and death, taken by many, according to Jesus, and a narrow one that leads to life is taken by a few, according to Jesus. We always want to know what Jesus says. Well, this is what Jesus is saying. And this is what's so horrible and so sad reality of the world we live in. Very few people will be in heaven. Wide gate is meant for the many who choose the path of destruction because it's easy. The narrow gate represents the few who seek and find life. Jesus encourages us to take the narrow gate instead of trying to enter the broad one. He's, he's, he's telling us this. He's commanding us this. But the question becomes, what does it mean? What does it mean? For wide is the gate and broad is the way. You know what it is? It represents a self-reliance, an everyday worldly ethic of man's law. Because man's law is... Man is going to change the law for man, not for God. But it's God's law that ultimately governs us as disciples of Jesus. And when we don't follow God's law, it ultimately leads to destruction. We're seeing that all across America today. It is impossible for us to attain a level of righteousness required for perfection, and that's why we need Jesus as our Savior. We must rely on His righteousness because we are not righteous enough to get into heaven. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about in, in Corinthians chapter 5, Paul explains to us how Jesus took our sins, granted us his righteousness, and it leads us to reconciliation. But you're going to see me talk about next week because that's going to be the scripture next week. There are going to be those who will preach falsehoods to promote the broad gate. There's only one way to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying this very clear. It's through the narrow gate. He set the standard of perfection. Be perfect for your Father in heaven is perfect. How many attempted to be good enough with their own actions? Taking a path that, that leads to destruction. Jesus explained that perfect perfection is not attainable. But it is attainable if you rely on Him. Being humble in spirit recognizes the need for a Savior. That's what is righteousness. The words of Jesus, we went over in this, in this beautiful chapter, in chapter 7. You guys remember them? We talked about one of them two weeks ago, and we talked one of them last week. Judge not that you be judged. Everybody loves to quote that verse. Man, everybody loves to quote that verse. He loves to quote the one that we talked about last week. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But do you think people like for, to, for, to hear that the gate is narrow? Jesus has been admired throughout history as a great teacher, great communicator. He's a great prophet. But tell Jesus, tell people that Jesus is God, look out. No, I'm just telling you, look out. Tell, tell people that Jesus says the gate is narrow. You need to live by his word. You need to repent and come to him. Look out. Because every single person in this room, everybody that's watching online, everybody in this world has been compelled to make a choice. And the choice is really simple. It's a decision about what kingdom you want to belong to. It's that simple. It's that hard. Two opposing gates lead to two different paths. Ultimately, it leads to two rival kingdoms. One is God's, one is Satan's. Guys, we've got to be ready. I'm just telling you, we've got to be ready. I was telling the Sunday school class today, I wrote an article this week about um, the Let Us Burn tour. A guy by the name of uh, Lucian Greaves. He's the leader of the Satanic Temple of America. And I don't know if you guys know, there's an evangelist named Sean Fott, and he's a ORU graduate, and he goes all across the country and he does revivals. Well, this Lucian Greaves doesn't like this, so he's now going to do his Let Us Burn tour, and he's raising money from all these different secular places to say Let Us Burn, to worship Satan. You're seeing this. Every single one of us is, is compelled to make a choice. It's a similar two paths. 
See, this is not the first time this has come up in the Bible. I mean, David talked about it in Psalms 1, where David describes a path as one is, leaded, one is wicked and one is righteousness. Those who find the righteous path will follow God in His Word, <coughs> reflecting throughout it on the day, and becomes trees, you, those of us who are in Christ, and we reflect on this Word, and we pray in this Word, and we come into His house. We become trees of life that thrive in any season, any season. In the opening of Israel's worship hymnal, in Psalms chapter 1, the psalmist urges worshipers to choose. Choose what gate, what direction will you go in your life? Sincere worshipers in Christ, faithful to the path which is righteousness. You're going to see throughout history of the world, you see two notable religious systems. One is crafted by God to treat holiness and the other is crafted by Satan. And it's that simple, it's that hard. Religious dominations in America live by the abyss of feminism. You're seeing that, you're starting to see that. And then we're going to replace the gospel with social justice, replace the gospel with, with, with enagrams, with wicked things, replace the gospel with the things that are running contrary to God's word, replace the gospel so they could widen the gate Let's move that Overton window left or right. Widen the gate. But God's saying, Jesus is saying, narrows the gate based on God's grace requires faith. Because widening the gate is a human effort. It's flesh. While there are countless religious forms with names of man systems, they ultimately derive from human achievement. I think it's fascinating I was looking at another thing I put in this article this week is how the state religion now has become the pride movement. That's the state religion. And it just, how do you get $8.6 million from the federal government to put into your school systems to encourage children to get uh, trans, trans surgery? That's happened in California, it's happened in Michigan, it's happened in Ohio. They got an eight point six million dollar grant, not to, to teach teachers, not to, to, to not tell children, to tell, to tell their parents ways that you can keep, you can promote this without the parents knowing. And we're using federal tax dollars to do this. Now let me ask you something. Now, can we get eight point six million dollars to talk about Jesus with your children? Do that in a, do that in a place, and let, let's see what happens. But we can do eight point six million for the state religion. This is the point I'm getting at. And this is what happens when you keep the gate, keep getting wider and wider and wider. We're going down that wide path because it's easy. But notice what Jesus continues to say here in verse 14. Let's go to verse 14. Okay. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. This is very frightening here, guys. And this is not Scott's words. This is Jesus' words. There are few who find it. I want you to let that sink in. This is not, this is not from, well, what did Jesus, this is what Jesus is saying. Few will find it. Why? Because the gate's narrow. And these are his words, they're not Scott's. Throughout the Bible, Jesus emphasizes the path of righteousness. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's a hard journey. It's filled with challenges. And I can see it. Everybody in this room, everyone in this room that is of Christ, you're having challenges. You might have had a sin in your life. You may be going through something right now. Jesus didn't promise it was going to be easy. You've got to stay the course. To indeed follow Jesus, we must sacrifice our own desires. We've got to live by faith. We're going to preserve through trials and patience. Maintain the lifestyle that separates us from the world. And it's hard. When he says difficult is the way, these aren't, guys, this is not some feel good uh, self help speech. This is Jesus talking. Difficult is the way. Unfortunately, when we give a choice between a demanding narrow path versus a comfortable one, what happens? We, we, we t have a tendency to choose the latter, right? Human nature seeks pleasure. <coughs> Human nature seeks convenience. But following 
Jesus requires us to walk in his footsteps. And I will tell you guys, sometimes that's very hard because sometimes we have to pay the price of true discipleship. And that's why it's so, de- it's so easy sometimes that pastors will ride Balaam's donkey. If you recall the story of Balaam, who was always trying to stay on both sides of the issues because he loved the popularity. He loved the money. He loved the speaking engagements. He loved the book endorsements. He loved all that. He loved every single bit of it. And here's the thing, guys. Yes, Jesus loves the world. He offers the salvation to accept it according to the Bible. 1 John uh, chapter 12, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus loves the world. Yes, he does. But you've got to do it on his terms. His terms, not anybody else's. This is where the confusion is today. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10, 9. It's that simple. But it's in his terms. He's provided us a way on the narrow way. He has provided us a route to heaven. He's provided your children a route to heaven. Not ours. It's not our terms. Making our own paths or approaching a holy God is impossible on the world's wide gate. As it is written, there is none righteous, it's not one, Romans 3.10. Jesus will not ignore, nor will he overlook sin. Justice requires that it has to be paid for because he cannot allow you to be in heaven, although he would love for you to, because heaven's quarantine, guys, sin's not allowed in there. So Jesus gives us a way out. His gate's narrow. He's merciful, but he's also just. He paid the price for our sin at a significant cost to himself. Without the blood covering of Jesus, we stand guilty before God. Wide is the gate, large is the path. That Jesus is obstructed by sin. But Jesus removes that destruction through his blood. None deserves a second chance, and we should all remain on the wide road. But despite this, God loved us so much that he created a path for us and he died on the cross for us. Can I get a witness right there? It's that simple. Difficult is the way which leads to life. Jesus is aware that our self-centered, sin-filled world, people will desire him enough to come to him on his terms. We have to come to him on his terms, not ours. Satan has made a highway to hell, and it's smooth, it's sexy, it's nice. There's all kinds of neat things on that highway. It's really fun to ride down. Because a lot of times, guys, here's the problem. Sin is fun. I'm just being honest. You guys know what I'm talking about. Most people let their passions and desires control their lives. Selecting a temporary earthly treasure over the self-sacrifice required to follow Jesus. Narrow is the gate. It's disregarded. And in closing, human beings prefer to create their own religions. You're seeing it today. We're crafting our own gods in the United States. Therefore, Jesus sorrowfully declared the road to eternal life and the road to heaven This is what's sad, guys. Only a few are going to find it. Many find it so hard to go down that narrow road. There are so many people that think they might have found it just because they they might have walked the aisle, signed a card, and one of the things that I'm going to really hit home with with the kids at False Creek this year, there are kids that come with us I'm going to pray, and I want you guys to put this in your prayer. Yes, pray for them that they will find Jesus this week if they don't know Jesus. But the most important prayer that you can give to them besides that is make this prayer that they have a lifetime commitment to Jesus. Can I get a witness? 
Not just say, hey, man, I got saved at False Creek and then never come back to church, never go back to your word, never pray to God. Say, well, I got saved. It's got to be beyond that, guys. Especially in the time that we're living in today. Our kids need Jesus seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So do our adults. Can I get a witness? I mean, it's just that simple. Why? Because Jesus said the gate is narrow. I'm going to close with this verse. Jesus says, if the world hates you, you knew that, that they hated me first. If you were of the world, the world would love you its own. Yet because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world. So the world's going to hate you, John 15, 18. Why does Jesus give us this warning? Because on the day of judgment, it's going to be hard. Then he will say to those on his left hand, depart from me you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. You know, guys, the most profound truth in the Bible is the gate is narrow. So many people think it's not. Jesus is aware of our self-centered, sin-filled world. Few people will desire him enough to come to him on his terms. Hey, Satan has made this highway to hell smooth. We've got to get people off of it. With every head bowed and all eyes closed. Father God, I thank you for this message. I thank you for this verse, these two verses. Father, I'm going to pray right now. If somebody here is not sure about their salvation and too embarrassed to come forward, let them remember that the, this gate is narrow. It's not wide. And I know the Holy Spirit's working in here today, and there may be somebody that's not sure this is that time to say, let's just give it all right here. I want to be on that narrow road with you, Father. I want to go through that narrow gate. If somebody watching on the line, it's really simple. Admit to Jesus that you're a sinner. Believe that he is the Son of God, that he died and was buried, and he arose on the third day. And then commit to him forever, not just today but forever father we love you and we praise you and we ask these things in jesus name we pray amen please stand with me